So without further ado, I, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker um, for uh, this morning, uh, which is Dr. Marcella Wozniak. Um, uh, Dr. Wozniak uh, received her Bachelor of Sciences in Biochemistry at Catholic uh, University. Uh, she received her uh, MD degree from the University of Maryland and went on to um, earn her PhD also at the University of Maryland in physiology. Um, keeping with the University of Maryland theme, she did her medical internship, her neurology residency, and her stroke fellowship at the University of Maryland. She is uh, uh, the author of multiple uh, papers, um, the recipient of many grants, has authored uh, two book chapters, and she has received numerous awards for her teaching and is a very accomplished speaker. She currently is the director of neuro the Neurology Care Center of University of Maryland, <laughs> uh, not surprisingly. And so we are really uh, fortunate to have um, Dr. Wozniak here, uh, who's an expert in the genetics of stroke, to uh, teach us a little bit about that topic. Thank you very much. Um, I know what you guys are all thinking now. Thank God they got a short speaker. She's going to stay on time. <laughs> I'm going to try to live up to my reputation and do that. Um, it's a great privilege today, and I want to thank Dr. Dressler and the Delaware Stroke Alliance for asking me to talk about one of my most favorite topics, stroke. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of change in the world of stroke in the last 20 years. For those of you who remember when this was sitting back in the emergency room as a non-emergent situation. But there's still further changes to come, and one of the things we're starting to understand as more and more important is that stroke is not merely an inevitable consequence of aging blood vessels, but in fact there are other influences on it. And we can understand perhaps more about the pathophysiology of stroke by understanding the genetics of stroke, and we can also understand more about how to help our patients if we can think about the possibility of genetic contributions to their strokes. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about genetics versus genomics and a, just a general overview of some of the strategies and challenges for how you might think about keeping your mind open and thinking about the possibility of a genetic contribution to the patient that you're seeing with stroke. In the second part of the talk, I'm then going to review in a little more detail six different uh, specific disorders briefly, uh, which I think illustrate these points or have some importance either become their, because they're relatively common, I mean they're all rare but a little bit common, or because they have important treatment implications or teach us lessons. I'm going to then talk a little bit about something I've, that we've changed our recommendations for screening about, which is inherited thrombophilias. Don't do it. And then in the last few minutes of the talk, I want to try to summarize this. I'll share with you the results of a recent clinical uh, study which tried to develop a screening algorithm for routinely screening stroke patients uh, for genetic influences. Um, and that was not so successful, and instead share with you my clinical perspective for how we can actually bring something clinically relevant from this talk, you know, back to your practice, um, whether you're wh whatever healthcare professional that you are. Now first I just wanted to say gene versus genome, okay? So, we know that the vast majority of genetic material turns out not to be transcribed. It turns out not to actually directly produce proteins, but it has a regulatory feature. So what I'm going to be talking about today is really monogenetic stroke, stroke where there's a mutation in a gene which in and of itself is enough to cause an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke, okay? I'm not going to talk about another interesting topic, which is how multiple genes interact together, how variations in those regulatory areas may increase susceptibility to stroke, okay, um, and may also interact with pieces of the environment like diet, exercise, etc., and that a whole genome, not just a single gene, but all these interactions of genetic regulatory material, transcribed genes, and environment come together in, in, in the genomic uh, contribution to stroke. This is a topic where you're going to see a tremendous amount of new breakthroughs come through, not just in stroke, but in many diseases. And so a very nice uh, website by the American Heart Association has a nice online video 
uh, series as well as some written materials if you want to learn a little bit more about genomics and, and how it differs from the traditional view of genetics. But today, we're going to talk specifically about genetic associations with genes, okay? One gene that has a relatively major effect, okay, that is able to increase the incidence of hemorrhagic or ischemic stroke. Now, these are inherited in different patterns, okay? So we have autosomal dominant. If you have the gene, you're going to express the disease. Now, that makes it sound very simple, right? Walk around, find a bunch of people who all have exactly the same problem. Everybody has a stroke at age 20. We got it. It's genetic, right? Problem is, is that even in autosomal dominant conditions, there can be variable penetrance. So, for example, in a cavernous hemangioma syndrome, one person may have one and be asymptomatic their whole life. Their child could have 20 and have a hemorrhagic stroke and severe epilepsy, okay? So that's one of the challenges that we have. Autosomal recessives, also difficult to see sometimes. Uh, we can have X-linked disorders, which are symptomatic in men with their mothers and sisters serving as carriers of these diseases. Um, we can have mitochondrial, changes in the mitochondrial DNA, okay? So many ways that, that monogenetic disorders uh, can be transmitted. Inevitably, when we started to look at the genetics of stroke, guess what? We discovered that the risk factors for stroke, like cardiac disease, like hypertension, like atherosclerosis, also show up on the screens for stroke, right? Because we do know those things contribute to stroke. So that made our life a little bit more challenging. And as I said today, we're not really going to talk about genomics and polymorphisms or disease susceptibility, although it's going to be an emerging topic. So focusing first on ischemic stroke and monogenetic ischemic stroke, I'm not going to touch too much on the cardioembolic syndromes, which are primarily cardiac in nature, like Brugada syndrome, where you have um, you know, a chance for atrial arrhythmias, which obviously have a high risk of recurrent stroke. Um, I am going to talk a little bit at the end about uh, some of the prothrombotic genetic states, like protein C, protein S, an antithrombin-3 deficiency, which we're kind of no longer recommending uh, routine screening for in all stroke patients or even all young stroke patients. Um, I will spend some time talking about mitochondrial disorder, MILAS. Um, the uh, is kind of very fascinating uh, disorder and uh, perhaps may be one of the more common uh, disorders. Other thing we know is that different genetic loci seem not just to cause any kind of stroke, but may manifest themselves in different vascular beds. So for example, the chronic white matter changes that we typically see and we think of as being related to diabetes and hypertension and cigarette smoking actually can have a genetic basis, okay? And if you see someone who has extensive white matter disease, you might think about a cerebral autosomal dominant with stroke-like syndrome, catacil, um, as a cause of that. Um, you can also see large vessel disease uh, with small vessel disease, and there are some mutations which seem to make not only cerebral blood vessels, but blood vessels and indeed tissues throughout the body weak and prone to dissection and rupture. And establishing a diagnosis of these can have a lot of implications for the patient as well as family members. So, you know, how do we recognize these? Each one of these disorders in and of itself is kind of rare, okay? And we see a lot of stroke patients. So what would key us in whether we're the intake a triaging nurse or a rehabilitation professional or a physician, a primary care physician or a neurologist to say, you know what, I, I think I should be thinking about genetics here. Well, we can certainly think of the different disorders kind of based on what the pathology and the vessel involvement was. Um, although most dissections and isolated dissection is usually not have much of a genetic component, if there is additional features within the patient or the family that suggest connective tissue disorder, that's certainly something we would think about. And we actually should be clinically looking at our patients and seeing what they look like in terms of their face, their stature, their skin, and look for other manifestations of these diseases, uh, which can then clue us in that maybe this stroke is associated with a genetic disorder. 
Um, imaging can sometimes give us a hint, okay? So different imaging patterns can sometimes be helpful. We'll talk a little bit about family history and how to do it and why it's important. Not quite as simple as one might think. So as we said, it would be wonderful if everybody came in and said, yeah, half the people in the family had a stroke. They don't have any vascular risk factors. It happened in their 20s and 30s. We'd all pick that up right away, right? How, but in fact, that's not the way it is because what we've learned is that one clinical syndrome doesn't map to one gene and one gene doesn't map to one clinical syndrome, okay? We have a variety of genes which can cause a variety of clinical syndromes and a variety of clinical syndromes which are due to different genes. So, and, and why is it there this variability? We talked about penetrance. We talked about the fact that they're being modifying the genes. Interestingly enough, in mitochondrial disorders, um, we know that we all get our mitochondria from our mother. So in nuclear genetic material, we get half from our father and half from our mother. In, in mitochondrial disorders, we get all those mitochondria from our mother. Now, if our mother passes on to us a mutation in a few of her mitochondria, as the embryo develops, that mitochondria may not be equally distributed and that mutation may not be equally distributed throughout the tissues of the body. So you may have a case where it's called heteroplasmy. Only some of the cells in a tissue will have the mutation. The other cells will be not be, have the mutation. Depending on which ones are involved, you can see different clinical syndromes and different severities. And we also said there is an environment interaction so that some genes do not become apparent unless there is vascular comorbidities, which then the concept that risk factors will be absent uh, in genetic disease, no, they actually can be part of genetic disease and can unmask it. So pure absence of, of that doesn't really help us. Now, what about family history, okay? Um, how many people here know exactly what their grandparents died of? Right. <laughs> A couple hands go up, right? Okay. So, you know, on, honestly, we, we don't really know that much about our family history. Okay. Um, maybe at the time, the people didn't really think about what those diseases were. They didn't have autopsies. Even if they knew that information hasn't been passed along. Okay. So, you know, that's one of the limitations. Um, when you're taking a family history or you're trying to talk to people about genetic diseases, um, this is a conversation that it, sometimes we should recognize may not be easy. Um, there are oftentimes things that are known to some family members and not known to other family members. And when you're talking about screening a family of four children where two of them have a different parentage than the other two, but they're unaware of that, okay, that becomes a, a challenge. So these conversations recognize that they are sensitive, okay, and they may have implications. They, should be done in private with the patient, at least on the first go round. Sometimes things are new mutations, right? So, uh, for example, in Marfan syndrome, about 25% of the patients, it's a new mutation. It's not going to be in any of the family members, okay? Um, and as we said, there can be polygenetic or modifying genes that may affect the expression. So, we spent the first part of the talk just talking a little bit about genetic disease and how to think about it a little bit. Now I want to go through about six disorders as well as a little bit about uh, prothrombotic states and talk to you about um, how this illustrates some of these points and why these in particular might be ones that you might want to think about a little bit. I'm going to start out with, with catacil or cerebral autosomal dominant arteriopathy with subcortical infarcts. Good thing they call it catacil <laughs> okay. for obvious reasons here. Um, now, the interesting thing about this is that um, it, was for, it was one of the, although it's not the first monogenetic disorder by any stretch of the imagination, monogenetic disorders were recognized even before we understood about genetics, actually, in the 1800s. Um, but this is one of the more recent ones that was, was mapped and developed um, in, in France. A uh, very interesting uh, story there because it was done in a part of the Catholic French countryside where the average family size was about eight children per family, um, which actually helped <laughs> in, the, in the recognition and eventual diagnosis of this disorder. Um, and you can just see how technology is marching forward at this time. It, it took three years for them to figure out that notch three mutations were responsible for this. Now we're doing this much more quickly. We have better DNA technologies. Now we said that 
one phenotypic syndrome doesn't just equal one gene, okay? You can have a single notch mutation, and yet there can be varied symptoms that patients get. And indeed, if you look at a bunch of patients with Catacil, which is actually quite highly penetrant, you will see that the, when they start developing their symptoms is actually different at different times. So for example, the, all of these, migraine with aura, T2 hyperintensities on MRI, ischemic strokes, motor disability, and a variety of dementia or frontal lobe executive and memory problems are all parts of this syndrome. But they don't happen all at the same time, and not everybody has all of them, okay? And you can see, if you're talking at age 30, a patient with migraine with aura who has white matter abnormalities, you know, maybe this is a disease to think about, even if they don't have the other manifestations that we've mentioned here. And if the family history is yeah, my dad died of dementia or had Alzheimer's. Well, maybe not. Maybe your dad had Catacil. Now, Catacil were helped because there are some MRI features. Although there's extensive white matter disease, and that can look very much on certain parts of the brain, like even MS, for example, um, or, um, or, or traditional white matter disease associated with high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, etc., there are some unique locations, for example, the temporal lobe white matter um, is one of the locations where um, it's unusual to see uh, white matter changes here, and in the extreme capsules, unusual to see white matter changes here in those other inflammatory or neurodegenerative diseases. So those are the, the, the more diagnostic places that you look for. Um, they will, of course, have nonspecific things microbleeds, deep lacoons, which you can see with, for example, uncontrolled hypertension and smoking.